Welcome to section two of the complete web developer course. It's time for HTML. We've set up the text editor and browser, and now it's time to look at the basic language of every website, HTML. In this section, you'll learn how a basic HTML page is structured, and also what the key elements are that make up that web page. These are things such as headers, paragraphs, text forms, and tables. The project at the end of the section is exciting and will put everything you've learned into practice. You're going to build your first real website. Have a go when you get to it, and I think you'll be surprised at how much you've learned. All the code for the coding challenges and projects is at the end of each lecture. And if you ever get stuck, do post your question in the course Q&A forum. Right, let's get into this section. So we're finally ready to write our first ever web page. If you followed the instructions in the previous videos, you should have a page in front of you ready to accept your code. Just before we write any code, we're going to make sure that we're editing the right file. So in your text editor, just go to File and then Save As. And I'm just going to expand everything here by clicking the down arrow. You probably won't need to do that. And I'd recommend working on your desktop. This is where we're going to be storing all your files. So if you want to put them in your documents or somewhere else, then feel free. But if you're not sure, then just put them right here on the desktop. Now I'm going to create a new folder for them to be nice and organized. And I'm going to call it Complete Web Developer Course. Create, and then I'm going to create another folder within that called Chapter 1 and then HTML. Notice I'm using no spaces and all small letters here as is normal in web addresses and file names that are going to go onto the internet. So I'd recommend you do the same there. And then we'll change the title of our document to hello world.html. The .html extension tells us it's a web page. We're going to be looking at that in a little more detail in the next video. But for now, just leave it as hello world.html and save. And now, just to check where that file is, we can move our text editor and our browser out the way. And there it is. There's my lovely complete web developer course folder on my desktop. And if I double click on there, I can see the one HTML folder and then the hello world.html file in there. So let's add a quick bit of content to our hello world file. And it's going to be a very simple hello world. This is the standard first thing to write whenever you're learning to program. So I'd recommend doing that. But if you want to change it to anything else, then that's fine. And then we're going to use command or control S to save. Or you can go to file save if you prefer. And now, finally, we get to go to our hello world.html and I'm going to control click or right click on Windows, open with, and then Google Chrome. And that will then open our hello world.html file in our browser. And there it is. Wonderful. Congratulations. Might not look like much, but that's your first ever web page, which is quite an achievement, I think. Now we're just going to set ourselves up for the rest of the course in which we're going to be using a split screen setup. So you just need to resize your windows so that we've got the browser on the left and the code editor on the right. You can do this automatically, I think, but I quite like doing it manually to make sure everything is set up exactly as I want it. And then the great thing about having two programs like this side by side is that we can change our text editor and change our code to something like hello Rob. We can use command or control S to save that. And then we can just reload this page by clicking the arrow there or command R on Mac or F5 on a PC. And then it updates straight away. So this is how we're going to be working with code pretty much for the rest of the course. We're going to be coding something over here on the right, and we're then going to see the results straight away on the left, which is a really exciting and dynamic way of coding. So congratulations on making your very first web page. 
In the next video, we'll be finding out what exactly this HTML that I've been talking about is and how we can start writing some. So what is this HTML that I've been talking about so much? Well, it stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And essentially, it's the language of the web. It's the language that every web page is written in. If you want to learn more about it, just Google what is HTML, and there's some great explanations there that have a bit more detail. But for now, I'm going to show you some HTML, and that's what we're going to be working with. So we're going to go to a very nice website called example.com, which is very much what it says on the tin. It's an example website. It's a nice, easy way to get used to what HTML is and how it works. So this is what example.com looks like. What we want to do is to look at the HTML that creates this page. And we can do that very easily in Chrome by control clicking or right clicking on the page and clicking view page source. You can do it in most other browsers as well, but this is it. So this is the page source or the HTML that creates this page. So let's have a little look and see what's going on here. First off, you'll notice that quite a few things have these angled brackets around them. These are called tags, and they are special keywords that tell the browser something about the code that's being written. So here, you can see at the very top, we've got a doc type, which just tells the browser the document type that we're working with here, which is, of course, HTML. Then we've got a second tag, which says HTML, and that's where the HTML begins. Now, if I jump right to the end of the document down here, you can see we've got the same thing, but with a slash before it here. And so that means that is where the HTML ends. So the tag at the top here is known as the opening tag because it's where the HTML begins. And then the tag at the end is the ending tag or closing tag because it's where the HTML ends. Then moving down, we've got the head or header of the document. So this part is where information about the document, such as its title and some other special information is stored. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a minute, but just notice we've got a closing tag there with head in it. So that's where the head ends. So this bit here is the head of the page. I'm gonna ignore the contents of the head for the moment because they're a little bit more complicated and just go straight to the body so after the head comes the body, and there's the closing tag for the body. So this is the body part of the page, which as you might guess, contains the main content of the page. Then after the body, we have a div tag. Div here is short for division or section of a website. So we might divide the different sections up into different divisions, and we do that using div tags. So from the div starting tag to the div ending tag, is the div section. Now we're almost at the first bit of content here, but just before that we've got another tag which is h1, and that's known as a header tag, and it's header one. So this is the main header for the page, and there you can see its closing tag. So this is the h1 part of the domain, and essentially what that does is it takes the text example domain and makes it nice and big and bold. So the browser knows to make example domain big and bold because it's inside these h1 tags here. Next, we've got p, which is short for paragraph. So this is a paragraph tag, and this section here is therefore a paragraph. And paragraph just means normal text, really. So as you can see, this text here is just displayed normally. It's not particularly big and bold. And then underneath that, we've got a second paragraph section which has inside it a link we're going to be talking more about links later on so i won't go into exactly how this works but as you might guess this link if you click on it will lead to this page here so iana.org slash domains slash example not sure if i pronounced that right but hopefully you get the idea so that's the actual content of the page which is contained within the body tags there and that's why it ends up looking like that but there's a little bit more style that we haven't looked at yet. We've got this gray background and we've got this curvy white box here as well. So where is that encoded in the HTML? 
Well, this is where we need to look in the head section. So now let's have a quick look and see if we can get to grips with this. So first off, we've got a title, which is example domain. And the title is what appears in the browser tab up here. You can't actually see it anywhere in the page itself, but it's what appears in that tab up there. Then we have a char set or character set. UTF-8 is the standard character set. If you want to check out exactly what UTF-8 is, feel free to have a quick Google. But for now, we just need to know that our standard character set that we're going to be using is UTF-8. Then we have a second meta tag, which is content type. So this tells the browser again what the type of content is that we have here. And it's just text HTML and UTF-8. It just reinforces what we've seen up here. Then we have a viewport meta tag, which defines the width of our page, which is just set to the device width. And the initial scale is one, which makes sense. We don't particularly want to zoom in or zoom out when we load the page. And then finally, we've got this style section. So this is CSS or cascading style sheets, which we'll be looking at in much more detail in the next section. But for now, we can just have a look at some of it and see what it might be doing. So first of all, we've got body here, which matches our body tag down there. And we've got a background color and then a special code. And this code actually matches the gray of this background color. So if you had a different code here, you'd have a different background color. Then we've got a margin and padding settings, and we've got a font settings as well. So there's a number of different fonts that might be used on this page. And then we've got some styling instructions for the div tag, which you'll remember is that section there. So it's got a width in a certain number of pixels, a margin, some padding, a background color, and a border radius. So that's what sets up this white box to be the width that it is and to have those nice curvy borders there. And finally, we've got our link color, which just sets the color of the link to this blue here. And the text decoration none tells it not to be underlined because normally links are underlined, but on this website, they are not. And this last bit here, I won't go into much detail, but really it's just some special stylings that only happen if the width is less than 700 pixels, i.e. probably you're looking at it on a phone. So that's it. We'll be looking at this in much more detail in the next video, but all you need to remember at this stage is that we have tags in HTML, which open and close, and there are certain special tags that divide up the sections of our code. So the header, and then the body. And then within those sections, we have more tags that allow us to adjust the style and the content of the page that we're creating. Got that? I hope so. In the next video, then, we'll go back to your text editor and we'll start creating a website for ourselves. Now that we've seen the basic structure of a website, we're going to create one for ourselves. So let's close down these examples and go back over to our Hello World. We don't want to call this Hello World anymore because we want to create a new file. So I'm going to go to File and then Save As, and I'm going to call it mywebpage.html. You can call it whatever you like, but I'm going to call it something nice and straightforward like that. The .html on the end will let Visual Studio Code know that we're going to be coding in HTML. Now, a very quick challenge for you. Can you make this new web page, mywebpage.html, appear in your browser? Go for it. Did you manage that? I hope so. All you needed to do was go back to your desktop, open up the complete web developer course, go to chapter one HTML, and then double click on my web page. And there it is. Of course, the actual content is the same as what we had before, but we'll change that very soon. And we'll close the Hello World tab as well, because we don't need that anymore. So just to be absolutely sure that we're editing the right file here, let's get rid of Hello Rob, and then change the text to just hi. And then second mini challenge, can you make the word hi and the exclamation mark appear on your browser? 
I hope you manage that. You just need to save and then refresh this page here. So I used Command or Control S to save and then either click the arrow or Command R on a Mac or F5 on a PC. Right, so now we know that we're working with our right document, let's create an HTML file that looks roughly like the example that we had on example.com. Now I'm actually going to start with our HTML tag. So notice that my text editor here nicely predicts what I want to say, which is really, really handy. So I'm going to select HTML there and then end the tag. And what the text editor also does is creates an end tag for me because it knows that whenever I need a starting tag, I also need an ending tag. So that's fantastic. I'll just put a few enters in between those two to give me a nice gap to work with. Great. Notice I haven't put the doc type at the top there like we had on example.com. It's not strictly necessary, but feel free to add it in if you want to. It definitely won't do any harm. Now, can you remember the next section that comes in a HTML document? It is, of course, the head. Now notice that I've indented the head there. I've done that by pressing the tab button and that just allows everything to look a little bit nicer and you can then see very quickly that anything that's been indented here is inside the head section. It doesn't look great now maybe, but when we add a fair bit of code, it will become clear that indenting makes your code look a lot prettier and much, much easier to read. Then do you remember the next section that we had? After the head comes the body. So let's enter our body tag and then we get our closing body tag created automatically for us. And now we've got the basic structure of our web page. So we've got HTML and then closing HTML, head, closing head and body, closing body. Fantastic. What do you think that'll look like if we try and actually see it? I've saved it here and now I'm going to refresh. It's actually completely empty because we don't have any content here. So very quick challenge. Can you add some content which will then appear on this page? Go for it. I hope you added the content inside the body section. So I'm going to indent my text again using tab and then I'm going to save that and refresh there. My first web page. Fantastic. Notice that I haven't used paragraph tags there. If you did use paragraph tags, then well done, but they're not again strictly necessary. It will work without them, but we'll definitely use them once we're comfortable with them later on. And then my final mini challenge for you is to add a title to the page. Can you remember from the last video how we do that? I hope you got it. It's inside the head section and we just use the tag title like that. And then we can have whatever title we want. I'll just call it my web page. There we go. And then we'll save that and refresh and you can see the content hasn't actually changed at all but up here in the tab we can now see my web page and that's as far as we're going to go for now other than a little bit of tidying up just so we're not arbitrarily putting in spaces notice i haven't got the extra meta tags there you're very welcome to put them in but i'm going to keep things simple they're not absolutely necessary and at this point they don't really add anything to our web page so i'm just going to keep what we absolutely need and nothing else so there we go your first complete web page congratulations so now we have our first web page up and running we're going to look at some specific HTML tags that we can use to make our websites look like something other than just plain text. And in this video, we'll be looking at header tags. So I'm going to get rid of the text there, my first web page, and I'm going to do my first header tag. 
Now, do you remember how we do that from the example.com that we looked at a couple of videos ago? If so, then try putting in a header tag. Go for it. I hope you managed it. If not, don't worry. We open a tag in the normal way with our angled brackets, and then our first header tag we're going to use is H1. And then my text editor gives me the closing tag as well, which is very handy. If yours doesn't, then just write it out manually. It's not a problem. And I'm going to type, this is a big header. Then let's have a look. So we'll save that and take a look. There we go. So you can see this is what an H1 tag looks like with no custom styling. It's a nice, big, bold header. And that's about it. That's all we can do with an H1 tag. With an H2 tag, as you might guess, it's quite a big header. Not quite as big as H1, but let's have a look. There we go. So it's bigger than normal text and bold, but smaller than an H1. So you can probably see where this is going. We can have an H3. And it's getting smaller and smaller as we go on. And I'm actually just going to copy and paste so you don't have to see me type out each one. So that's going to be an H4. Let's have a quick look at that. So obviously we're getting smaller and smaller every time and we can keep going. So H5, smaller again. We're actually getting smaller than normal text here. And we can keep going. We can have an H6 header as well. I must say at this point, they're very rarely used, the H6 header. I don't think I've ever gone beyond an H4 in any of the websites that I've used. So it's very unlikely you'll use an H6. But just to point out, if we try and use an H7 header, we get back to normal text. So this is actually not an H7 header because H7 doesn't exist. So we can't use an H7 header. If we try to do it, it'll just give us normal text as if it hasn't recognized the tag. So headers go all the way from H1 to H6. But to be honest, you'll probably only use H1, H2, and maybe H3 in your documents, and occasionally possibly H4. But as I say, I've never used an H5 or an H6. But header tags are very useful and are also good for getting your site listed in Google if you put your important keywords that is the words that you want your site to appear for in Google in an H1 tag, then they're much more likely to appear higher up the Google search results than if you just put them in normal text. So I definitely recommend using H1 tags on all your pages and probably H2 tags as well if you've got some slightly smaller headings that you want to use. All right, so now you're an expert in header tags. In the next video, we're going to look at paragraph tags, which was the other formatting tag that we saw in the example.com website. Right, so we're now moving on from header tags to look at paragraph tags. Now, you might be wondering why we need paragraph tags. If we look at some standard text, just like that, you can see it looks pretty normal. And then if we put paragraph tags around it, which you might remember are just a P for paragraph, and then I'm going to manually put in the slash p to end the paragraph tag. If we then have a look at that, it doesn't actually look any different. The paragraph tag doesn't restyle the text at all. So what's the point? Well, let's go back to how here is some text. And now what if we want to put some text on the next line down? Well, you would have thought we could just do that and put it on the next line down in our text document. Let's have a look. No. So line breaks, as they are known, new lines in our text don't actually become new lines on the website itself. So we have to manually put new lines in. And there are two ways to do that, and I'll show you both of them now. The first one is to surround both of our lines of text 
with paragraph tags. Like that. So there's our first paragraph. And there's our second paragraph. So if we now save that and refresh, then they are on separate lines. So that's one use of the paragraph tag to give us a new line. It also makes our code look better because we can see very clearly that we expect these to be separate paragraphs. And we might want to apply different formatting to each paragraph, as we'll see how to do in the next video. There is another way to put text on a new line, though, and I'll show you that now. So if we have a third paragraph, let's have some text with a line break. Just like that. And if we want to put a line break in the middle, we use the tag BR, like that, which is short for break or line break. And let's just have a look and see what that looks like. You can see we've now got a line break where the BR tag is, but it's slightly different to the new paragraph. So it's not a full new paragraph because we don't have the gap in between, but we do have the text on a new line. So they do slightly different things, the paragraph tag and the BR tag. And you could imagine in different situations you might want new paragraphs or just a line break like that. One thing to notice about the BR tag, it's the first tag that we've met that doesn't have a closing tag associated with it. And there are going to be a few more that we'll see along our journey. So BR is what's known as a self-closing tag because it's just a line break. It doesn't surround anything. You may also see BR with a slash in it like that. And this is when you're using XHTML, which you don't really need to worry about at this point, but you can look up if you want to know more about it. It's essentially a very precise version of HTML that you might want to use in some circumstances, and that would have a slash right there in the tag itself. But with HTML and HTML5, you don't need to use that. So you should just use BR like we've got there. So that's how you use paragraph tags and line breaks. Now you're really getting up to speed with HTML. In the next video, we'll see how to customize our text to change its look and style within a paragraph. See you there. Right, so now you're familiar with paragraph tags and line breaks. We're going to see if we can customize the look of our text a little bit more. As you might have guessed, we're going to use a range of tags to do that. So first off, we're going to look at how to make some text bold. And there are two ways that we can do that. The first that I'll show you is the B tag, which as you might imagine is short for bold. So if we just pop B and then slash B around a certain letter or string of letters, then if we have a look at that, that will come out bold. Fantastic, simple as that. The B tag is perfectly valid HTML, but generally it's encouraged to use the strong tag instead, which does exactly the same thing, but is a little bit easier to read. So strong just makes it clear in your HTML that you want this to be dis displayed strongly and clearly and boldly. So you're welcome to use B or strong, and you will see both of those when you're looking at the code of other sites. I'd recommend using strong if you've got the choice. Next, we'll look at italic text. And similarly, we've got two tags that we can use. The first one, just like the bold tag, is I. So there is some italic text. Let's have a look. There it is. So nice and italic. And the second one, so instead of strong, we've got EM, which is short for emphasis. There we go. And again, it looks exactly the same, but it's generally considered better form to use EM, which is slightly clearer than I in terms of its meaning. But you will see both when you're looking at the code of existing websites and you can use either in HTML5. Next, we'll look at underlining some text. So we'll get rid of our line break and we'll look at some underlined text. As you might guess, we can use the U tag to underline text. Now the U tag has an interesting history and was actually removed from HTML in version 4.01, but then brought back in in version five so you can use it. It is valid HTML. Let's have a little look at that. So we've got underlined text like that, but it's generally preferred that we use ints, which is short for inserted, 
to imply that our underlined text has been inserted into our paragraph. Now, once again, you can use you and you'll see it everywhere, but ints is inserted and that's what's generally preferred. Okay, just a couple more. We'll have some superscript. So just the same. So superscript means high up in the air and we use the sup short obviously for superscript tag to do that. Okay, quick challenge for you. Can you work out how to do some subscript text? Go for it. I hope you managed to, to guess that one. It's just exactly the same, but sub instead of sup. So subscript is slightly below the line. And there it is. All right, the last one I'm gonna show you is some struck out text. And we're going to do that using the DEL tag, short for delete it. There we go. So now we have some crossed out text there. This used to be strike in HTML4, but that has actually been deprecated in HTML5, and we now use the DEL tag. But you may see strike used in websites that you're looking at. Last, I'm gonna show you a completely separate tag, which I'm quite keen on, which is the horizontal rule. So again, it's a self-closing tag. It doesn't have a closing element but it just draws a nice horizontal line. So it's good for adding sections to a page. If we put it in here, for example, we might want to separate the first three from the last three. And that's a very nice way to do it. So again, self-closing in HTML5, you don't need the closing element. If for some reason you're doing XHTML, then you would put the closing bit in like that. And you might well see it like that in some websites but for HTML5, you should just have the HR. If you want to find a few more different stylings that you can do with HTML, then just go to Google and very quickly you can get this with HTML formatting and just click on the top result, which will take you to a website called W3Schools, which has got a lot of information on basic HTML tags. And down here they've got a bunch of formatting elements so we've seen quite a few of those but there's a few even that we haven't seen further down so we've got small marked which is highlighted there inserted which we saw and subscript and superscript etc so if you want to look more into HTML formatting you can but we're actually going to move on and look at lists in HTML All right, we're steaming through our HTML tags now, and we're gonna move away from paragraph tags and look at lists in the next couple of videos. In this video, we'll look at unordered lists. So basically, a bullet point list is what we're trying to create here. And an unordered list we create with the UL tag. So the UL tag creates an unordered list, and then within our unordered list, we have a list item. So I'm gonna make a list of my family members. I'll start with me. So that's it. I've got an unordered list at the beginning. I'm closing the unordered list. And then when I want to add a new list item, I just do the same thing. And then we'll add Kirsten in. And then we want another list item. So we'll add Tommy. And finally, Ralphie. There we go. So let's have a look, see what that looks like. Beautiful. So we've got Rob, Kirsten, Tommy, and Ralphie. So that's how you create an unordered list in HTML. Let's have a very quick challenge for you. Can you apply different formatting to each of the four elements in your list? You can choose any bit of formatting that you like, but different formatting, bold, italic, etc., to each element in your list. Go for it. All right, hope you managed it. I'll do it something like this so Rob can be strong.
Kirsten can be emphasized. Tommy, very unfortunately, will be deleted. And Ralphie can be inserted. There we go. Let's have a look. There we go. So we can apply this formatting to anything. It doesn't have to be in a paragraph tag as we did in the previous video. Text can be anywhere on our page. Wonderful. So simple as that. That's how we create an unordered list. In the next video, we'll see how to do very similarly an ordered list. So now we've seen how to create unordered lists using UL to create the list and then LI to create individual list items. Can you guess how we might create an ordered list? Have a go. I hope you guessed right. All we do is change UL to OL for ordered list and the same in the closing tag there. And then if we take a look at that, it's exactly the same except we've got numbers instead of bullet points, so it's ordered. And we can have a little bit of fun with ordered lists and we can mess things around a little bit. So say for example, for some reason, I wanted to start my list at the number 10 rather than the number one. I can use an extra attribute as it's known in my OL tag to set the start value. So I just use start and then equals and then usually in quotes, we'll put the number that we want to start at. So if I want to start at 10, for example, I just put start equals 10. And a bit like the U tag for underline, start was actually deprecated in HTML 4.01, but it's back in in HTML 5, and it's supported by every major browser out there. So you can use it quite safely. We can also do a couple of other fun things. We can use reversed in there. And that will do what you might guess, 4, 3, 2, 1. So that does everything in the opposite order. And finally, we can specify the type of ordered list that we want. And there's a few type options. And you can see my text editor here is very nicely giving me the options. I could use type is equal to A. And that will then give me A, B, C, D. Let's look at the other type options. So we've got capital I there, which gives me capital Roman numerals. There's small i as well, which gives us small Roman numerals. And finally, we've got small a, which gives us a, b, c, d. So a lot of people don't actually know that you can change the type of an ordered list, but you can very easily. All right, that's all you need to know about lists for now. In the next video, we'll go on and see how we add images to our web pages. So now we're going to move on from lists and look at how we can include images into our web page. Of course, before we can include an image, we'll need to get one that we want to include in our page. Now you can use any image you've got on your computer, but I'm going to show you how to do it with an image that we find online. So I'm just going to go to Wikipedia and search for my favorite cartoon character, Homer Simpson. And there he is. So I'm going to get this image and put it into our web page. So I'm going to do that by control clicking or right clicking on the image and then save image as. And that will save the image onto my computer. I'm going to save it in the same folder as my webpage.html file and I'm just going to change it to Homer to keep it simple, much easier to access then. There we go. So that saved the Homer.png image. PNG is a file type for an image. If you have a different image, you might have JPEG or GIF instead. It doesn't matter. They all work the same way, but it is important that you know what the whole file name for your image is. All right, now we can go back to our web page and let's see how we add an image. It's actually pretty straightforward. 
So we'll get rid of our code for the ordered list. And then to add an image, we use the IMG tag. And this is a self-closing tag. So again, we just close it there. There's not going to be a closing of the image tag. But we do need to specify an attribute for this tag, and that is the SRC or source. So this tells us or tells the browser where the image is and what it's called. So we're going to call it homer.png. You can see that the text editor I'm using here actually predicts that for us because it's looking for file names in the same directory as the web page, which is really handy. But if yours doesn't, don't worry, just type out the file name and then save that and then refresh. And there we go. So now we've got an image right there in our web page. And we can, of course, add whatever other content we want to this. So we might want to put a little label underneath just to say that this is Homer Simpson and that will then align itself underneath the image. So there's lots of ways that you can customize images. I'm just going to show you a few here. So first off, what we might want to do is change the size of the image. And we might do that using width equals and then and let's say we want to set the width to 100 pixels. Let's have a look and see what effect that has. So you can see 100 pixels is quite a bit smaller than it is by default, but it nicely scales the image as well. If you didn't want the image to be scaled, you might want for it to be a square image for some reason. So you could then specify the height as being 100 as well, and then that would squish the image up. You can also change the alignment of the image. So if you want it to align right, and then the image will be aligned to the right of the page. The last thing I'd like to show you is that you can actually link to an image directly on the internet. So let's go back to Wikipedia. And let's say instead of Homer, we wanted a picture of Marge Simpson. There we go. And this time, instead of saving the image as, we're going to copy the image address, which copies the URL or web address for the image, which I've just pasted in there. So it starts HTTPS and then has a load of extra stuff and ends up with Marge Simpson.png. So I can actually paste that directly into my source or SRC attribute for the image tag. And then that will load it directly into the page. So that saves us having to download it and allows us to link to it directly on the Wikimedia servers. A word of warning though, obviously if you don't have control over the image, they might change the location of it or block you from downloading it for some reason. It wouldn't be a good idea to do this on a production site. And also this is known as hot linking when you link to an image on someone else's site. And quite often they don't like that, especially if your site is very busy and they start to get lots of server traffic because you're taking the image from their site. So I'll just change that to Marge. And I think I preferred the alignment being on the left. We'll leave that as it is there. Nice. Generally, any images on your site, I'd recommend downloading and putting on your servers and accessing from there rather than doing this hot linking. So we're now going to move on from images and see how we can start to build in a little bit of interaction with our web pages by using forms. All right, so we're now going to say goodbye to Marge and get rid of our image. And we're going to look at how we can add forms to our web pages. Forms allow your pages to be interactive and the users to enter data, tick boxes and click buttons. So they're really powerful and really easy to use. Let's see how we get started. As you might guess, there's a tag called form. And that's what we're going to use to create our forms. And then anything inside a form will be then part of that form. So a very basic element to have in your form is an input element. Now this is one of those self-closing tags again, so we don't need a closing tag, 
but let's just have a look what input on its own looks like. It's very simple, it's just a box. So it's a box and then you can start typing some text in there if you want to. So you might have something like username and then a colon and then your input and it looks like that. Now the input tag here has several attributes that we can use and the first one we'll look at is type. So we can have different types of input and you can see quite a few of them being predicted for me there. So the first one I'll just show you is text. So this is exactly what we've got here. So this is the default type. But really, if you're going to use an input, you should use a type regardless of whether you're using the basic type or not, just so that it's clear in your code that you want this to be a text input. But let's have a look then at some of the other types of input that we can use. In fact, we'll put that in a paragraph so that they'll all be on different lines. So let's create another input with a type of and we'll first look at checkbox. Let's see then what that looks like. It's what you might guess, a simple tick box. So quite often you might see that next to, for example, if you're in a login form, there's often an option to stay logged in and then you can decide with your checkbox whether or not you want to stay logged in. Another type of input is the radio input, which is not necessarily so obvious as to what it is. But let's take a look. You will definitely have seen them while going around the web. So it's very similar to a checkbox, but the difference is with each set of radio buttons, you can only select one of them. So for example, you might want to have one that says under 18, and then another that says over 18. Like that. Of course, you could have a whole string of different sets of ages, and they would only be able to check one of those. Now, if you try that, however, at the moment, we can select both. And that's because we haven't linked these up in any way. Our code doesn't know that these are part of the same set of radio buttons and we can link them up by giving them a name. So we might say age. So now that they both have the same name, if we now see how it works, if we click one and then select the other, you can see we can only select one of them. And again, if we had a whole string of these, we would only be able to select one of them if they all had the name age. And in fact, later on when we do more work with forms, we'll see that pretty much every form element should have a name so that you can refer to it and do something with it when the user submits the form. But to do that, you need a little bit more coding knowledge than we have at the moment, so we'll get there when we come to it. The next element we'll look at is the dropdown, and this actually works differently. It's not an input, it's a select. So let's see how this works. You can see we've got a select tag there, and then inside the tag, we have our options. So let's say, for example, that we want to get the favorite food of our user. And yes, I am spelling that with a U. And let's just get our tabs looking nice. This is our first long bit of code, so it starts becoming more important that we set up our tabs nicely. So let's pop a few foods in there. Pizza. We'll have ice cream. And sandwiches. That should do. You can see that that's nice and clear now that everything here is inside these paragraph tags. And then this, these option tags are inside the select tags as well. So you can see we've got a nice drop down there and the user can select whichever one they want. Fantastic. The last one I'm going to show you is the submit button. So most forms are going to need this for the user to tell you that they finished. So that's just 
another input type. And all we need to do is have a type of submit. Just like that. And then let's have a look. And then we've got a nice submit button at the bottom there. So this is a really nice basic form that uses several different elements. We've got a text input. We've got a checkbox. We've got a pair of radio buttons. We've got a select or drop down. And then we've got a submit button at the bottom. There are, of course, some other form elements, but these are the basic ones that you'll be using over and over again. Before we move on, I'm just going to show you a little bit how to customize some of these. So, for example, we might not want the submit button to have the word submit on it. We might want it to have a different value or text. And we do that using value, so the value attribute. So we might want to have click me, something like that, and that then changes the text on the button. The value attribute can actually be used in most of these as well. So for example, we might want to set a default username for some reason. If we wanted to do that, we just put it in as a value attribute on the username input like that, and then it would appear there and the user can get rid of it if they want to. Similarly, we could add a value attribute to the radio buttons so that code will know which one they've checked. So we might have something like value equals under 18. And value equals over 18. And then later on when we wrote some code to process that, we'd know which one had been selected by the user. Now, Setting the value of username to your username isn't particularly useful because most people are then going to have to click there, select it, delete it, and then enter their username. So that's not a great way of guiding your users to do something. But if you do want to give the users a hint as to what to type in the box, you can use the placeholder attribute. Let's just have a look and see what that does. So it still puts your username in there, but you can see it's a bit faded. And then when you click in the box and you can just start typing Rob and that disappears straight away. So if you want to give the user a bit of guidance as to what to put in the box, then the placeholder attribute is a great way to do that. All right, two more things. First off, we might want to have this checkbox selected by default. And we can do that really easily by putting the word checked into the checkbox input as an attribute. It doesn't actually have a value, it just says checked. And then if we have a look, you can see it's checked by default. And finally, we can change which one of the three options appears as the default. So you can see pizza appears because it's at the top there. But if I want ice cream to appear as the default when the user loads the page, I just put an option of selected in there. And let's now have a look. You can see ice cream appears as the default one. And that's it. So for now, obviously, your form doesn't do anything when you click the form, you can see the page is reloaded, but we haven't written any code to actually process the form in any way. And we'll do that later on in the course. But you've learned about several different HTML elements and put them all together to make your first form. Congratulations. We're going to move on now to look at tables in HTML. OK, now we're forms experts. We're going to get rid of our form here and start looking at tables in HTML. Tables are really useful ways of setting out data or any kind of information to the user in a sort of Excel spreadsheet-like manner. Let's take a look and see how we do it. As you might be able to guess, we use the table tag to start off our table. And then within the table, we have a table row, so TR. And then within the table row, we have individual table cells. And for those, we use TD, which is short for table data. So if, for example, I wanted to put my family's favorite colors here, I might have Rob and then another item of data or cell and then green. And that would then fill the first table row. Let's just have a quick look and see. At the moment, that just looks like Rob and green. Nothing particularly special there. But then we can add another table row in the same way. And then 
we could have Kirsten and her favorite color, orange. Very cheerful. So now you can see it spreads out everything nicely so everything's well aligned within the table. So now I'm just going to copy and paste these so you don't have to watch me typing them again, but we'll have Tommy. His favorite color is somewhat in transition, but at the moment it's still pink. And then Ralphie, who doesn't really know what his favorite color is, but he's been assigned blue. So there we go. That's what our table looks like. It's not much to look at, but in the next section we'll see how we can change the style with CSS and get some really pretty, well spaced out tables. I'll just show you a couple of other things that we can do with tables. The first is we can have a table head section. And then in our table head we might have a table row again. And then here instead of having a standard bit of table data we have a table heading section. So we might have name for the first column, for example, and then favorite color, two U's in there, fantastic. And then let's check that out. And you can see that we've got a slightly different styling on the table head cells there. So they're bold and they're centered as well. And we could obviously change that styling if we wanted to. If we didn't like that favorite color goes on for a bit too long, we could add a line break in there. And then it would again align everything nicely, horizontally and vertically for us. Finally then, if we're going to have a table head, we should really separate the second part into a table body. Now this doesn't actually change anything in terms of the look, but it makes our code nice and clear as to which bit of the table is which. Now you can see I was individually indenting all of those. With most text editors, you can actually indent a whole chunk of code just by selecting it all. And then pressing tab and that then indents everything really nicely. Excellent. So you're now pretty familiar with HTML tables. In the next video, we'll look at one of the original innovations that led to the web, really the thing that holds it all together, and that is links. All right, so let's get rid of our lovely table code there and see how we can link from one page to another. You've all spent plenty of time clicking on links, I'm sure, and they're actually really easy to introduce into your pages. So let's put our link inside a paragraph tag. And the tag that we use for links is the A tag. I believe that stands for anchor. We'll see specifically what an anchor link is in a few minutes time. But first I want to show you how we can link to, for example, the Google homepage. So the A tag generally just has the one attribute and that's href. So that's short for hyperlink reference. And that is the URL that we want to link to. So the full URL of Google is http colon slash slash www.google.com. There we go. And then inside the a tag, you put whatever text you want to use for the link. So click here to go to google.com or something like that. So if we click there to go to google.com and then we click there, that takes us to the Google homepage. Simple. Now you can actually put anything you like in this A tag here. So here's a quick challenge for you. Can you put an image inside a link and then Make it so that when you click on the image, it goes to a website of your choice, say Wikipedia. And you can use the same image that we used a couple of videos ago, if you like. Go for it. All right, I hope you manage that. 
The way we do it is we set up the link in exactly the same way. So we're going to go to Wikipedia. So just type in wikipedia.org. And then inside the tag for link, we put our image tag. So if you remember, that's img and then source src equals and then my one was homer.png. There we go. Simple as that. So let's have a look. So we've now got our first link is still there and there's our lovely Homer image. If we then click on that, it takes us to wikipedia.org. You can see it redirected nicely. All right, so that's how we do links to pages on other websites. We can also do links within our website and they work slightly differently. These are known as absolute links because no matter where you are on the web, any link that goes to HTTP colon slash slash www.google.com will go to the same place. But there are things called relative links, which we'll see now, and they can be a little bit easier if you're linking within your website. I'm going to stretch out my text editor so that you can see my code a bit better. So they work in exactly the same way, but this time I'm going to link to hello world.html, which was our first page that we came up with. And you can see this time, I don't need to put HTTP da 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 da, I just put hello world.html because hello world is in the same folder and location as the page that we're in at the moment. So if they're in the same place, you can just put a link to them without having to put all the other stuff. Right. And that's really useful because you might move your site to a different domain name for some reason, or you might restructure your site so that things are in a slightly different place to where they were before. And if you do that using relative links, it should not break anything. So I'd recommend using relative links on your own site and then absolute links if you're linking to someone else's site. So let's just check this one out. There we go. Hello world. And then you can see it links nicely to what I changed to Hello Rob earlier. All right, the last thing I wanna show you about links, what I mentioned at the beginning, so anchor links, so linking within a page. Now, to make that clear, I'm gonna bring in several homers to give my page a lot of content. So let's just have a look, there we go, we can scroll up and down all those homers now. And one thing that's very useful when you've got a nice long page like this is a link at the bottom that says back to top. You've probably seen those on a few sites and they're really easy to create with HTML. And we do this using what's known as an ID. So I'm gonna take my paragraph tag, which begins the page, and I'm gonna give it an ID. And for now, we'll just give it an ID of top like that. Now IDs we're actually gonna be using a lot, first in CSS for styling and then in JavaScript to start getting bits of your web page interacting with each other. But for now, we'll just use them for this anchor effect. So now that we've got a paragraph tag with an ID, we can add a link at the end of our page and we use the hash symbol, which on a Mac is Alt-3. It'll be somewhere else on a PC keyboard, probably depending where you are in the world. And then after the hash symbol, we just use whatever word we use to describe our ID. So in this case, top. There we go. And then we just put in the text that we want to use for that link. And let's take a look. So now we scroll down and, oops, I'll just correct that. Let's take a look. Back to top. And that takes us right to the top of the page. Let's say, for example, that we wanted to jump to the third Homer. So one, two, three. Can you add in a link just underneath back to top to jump to the third Homer on the page? Go for it. All right, hope you managed that. 
It's obviously pretty similar to our back to top. We just add in an href again with a hash symbol and then I'll call it third homer like that and then whatever text you want so go to third homer and then third homer is here so let's give that paragraph tag an id of third homer there we go let's have a look so go to third homer then ah that hasn't worked you can probably see we didn't have a clickable link quick challenge for you can you see the mistake I've made in my code and why a clickable link isn't appearing? Can you spot it? Well done if you did. The third homer needs to appear here, in between these angle brackets. If you don't have a clickable link, it will be because of something similar to that. So go to third homer, then jumps not to the top, but to our third homer. Fantastic, we've got the absolute links which take you to a specific page on the web. We've got the relative links, which take you to a page on your website. And then we've got these anchor links, which take you to a different portion of the page that you're currently on. Brilliant, so we're almost at the end of this first HTML section. I've got a big challenge coming up for you. For now, there's one more thing I want to show you, and that is HTML entities. And we'll look at that in the next video. Congratulations on making it to the end of the first section. You've gone from not knowing how a website is put together to being able to put together pages containing forms, tables, links, images, HTML entities, and a lot more. So well done. We're going to put that into practice now by essentially creating a web page that contains everything that we've done so far. So I've got an example page that you can copy if you like, but really I want you to go crazy and create anything you like. It could be a home page about yourself, family, your favourite sports team, whatever you want. I'm sure it's going to be a lot more fun if you choose your own topic. But if you want a bit of inspiration, I'll show you what I'll be making. I'm going to challenge you to create something like this. It can be exactly this page if you like, or you can come up with your own design and content. You can see I've got a nice image of the earth here. I've got an unordered list, a link, an ordered list a table down there, and a very tiny bit of a form. And also a video of the Earth. So that uses pretty much everything we've covered so far. If you want to recreate this page, you can take a look at it from this lecture's resource. And you can also view the source code if you want, like we did with example.com earlier in this section. So what I'm going to do is challenge you to create something like this. You can get exactly this page if you like, or you can come up with your own design and content. Best of luck when you have done it. It'd be great if you uploaded it to your FTP space and then shared a link so that I can take a look and congratulate you personally. Don't forget to use all the good HTML habits that you've learned so far. So that's nice indenting, spacing out your code, etc. Go for it. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to close that down and start building our web page from scratch. So this is how I would have done it. Of course, as with any coding challenge, there are many ways to build a web page or solve a problem. You did it differently, that's absolutely fine. I'm going to start by going to example.com and just using example.com and just viewing the source as we did. So control clicking or right clicking, view page source. And then I'm just going to copy the whole of that source code and use that as my starting point. And that just makes sure that I get the doc type and everything else in there without having to type it myself. I'm pretty sure that it's going to be right. So don't be afraid to do that when you're building sites. Obviously, don't copy wholesale other sites, but free to use them as starting points so that you're not typing out the same code every time. And I'm just going to get everything nicely indented. And there we go. So now we've got our basic bit of content. Mine, of course, is about the world we live in, or Earth. So I'll call it the good old Hello World. So we'll do a quick refresh. Yep, so we've got no content there at all, but we've got a title of Hello World. All right, so I'm going to start with a nice big header. So we'll use H1 and 
we'll have a nice big hello world at the top. And you'll notice that as I go through the process of building the page, I'll refresh and just check that it looks okay a lot more than you might think. So even though we've just got a very basic bit of code there, it's always good to see that your new line of code hasn't broken anything or done anything unexpected. Okay, so now I'm gonna pop in a subtitle, so H2, a few facts about the world we live in. Uh, no full stop, I think. There we go, very nice. Now I want a nice picture of the Earth so I'm going to go to Wikipedia and search for Earth and there we go. Lovely big picture there. And as we've done before, I'm going to save the image as and I'm going to save it in my HTML folder. I'll just call it Earth. So this is a JPEG rather than a PNG. I'll remember that, but it should get auto-predicted by my text editor anyway. Okay, so let's pop in our image. Nice and simple, image SRC for source and earth.jpg gets predicted there. Brilliant, let's have a look. There we go, Ooh, a little bit large, I think. So let's make it a little bit smaller. So we can adjust that with the width, as we saw in the image section, and I'll try a width of 100. See how that looks. Oh, a little bit small. Try maybe 400. Okay, that's about right. Of course, we're not necessarily looking for great style here, but it's not hugely big, and but I can still see the detail of our planet there. Okay, now I want to get some information about the Earth. So I'm going to Google Earth in Space Facts. This looks good, spacefacts.com. All right, so I'm just gonna use this paragraph of content there. Now this bit of course you wouldn't do for any live site that you are working with but that's fine for a bit of practice but definitely if you're making a site that you're going to use publicly then make your own content. Okay let's have a look. Very nice. So now I want to have something with an unordered list So this bit of information looks good. So I'm gonna copy that. And if I keep the moon in there as well, then that will give me the opportunity to add a link. So I'll copy that over. Now this is a new section. So I'm gonna separate it from everything else with a horizontal rule. There we go. And now I'll paste in my new data. And actually, just to keep things simple, I'll only have three of them. And I want an unordered list. So that's a UL. And each of these is gonna be a list item. So let's pop that at the beginning and end of those and indent them so that the code looks really nice.
There we go. Great, let's just check. There we go, I'm liking that. Now let's add in our link for the moon. Now it goes to that URL at the bottom of the screen there, spacefacts.com slash the moon. So I'm gonna copy the link address, so I control clicked or right click and copy that. And then to add an anchor or link, I use an A tag with an href of what I just copied and then we'll have the text the moon and then we'll close the A tag. Let's have a look, see if that's worked, looks good, have a click. Brilliant. Links to the page about the moon. Fabulous. Now I'd like to have a bit of practice putting in an ordered list. So what I'll do is I'll copy the code for an unordered list and just change it to an ordered list. And to separate that out from the previous list, I'll add another horizontal rule. Now obviously we need some new bits of information there. So let's have a look. Facts about the Earth. Ah, oh, fantastic. So let's make these, to make them numerical data, we'll have an H3 a little heading saying top three facts about the earth. There we go and then I'm just going to copy these in. The earth rotation is apparently gradually slowing. Interesting stuff. The earth was once believed to be the center of the universe. Have that as fact number two. And the Earth has a powerful magnetic field. So we'll get rid of the link there because we don't need it anymore. Brilliant. Let's have a look. Fabulous. That looks great. I think now we need a little header above the previous list though to kind of match that out so let's put an h3 and we'll just call that about the earth okay great storming through so now I'd like to add a table So let's separate out the section again. And I'd like to have an opportunity to use HTML entity. So let's compare the radius and temperature of two other planets, just for fun. So we'll add in our table and we'll have our table header. And within our table head, we'll have a table row and within our table row, we'll have a TH, which is going to be the name of the planet. And then another TH for the radius of the planet. And another TH for the average temperature. Uh, 
Okay, let's just have a quick look. Yep, it's looking good. I think I might just add in a line break to make average temperature go over two lines. All right. So after the table head comes the table body. And within the table body, we have table rows. And within those, we have table data or table cells. So we'll start with Mars. So we'll need to get the radius of Mars. I think we can get this from our Space Facts website. So if we just scroll down, here we go, We've got some Mars facts here. So hopefully that'll tell us the radius and temperature of Mars. It's giving us the diameter. A little bit of maths for you. The radius is half the diameter, so I'm going to divide 6,792 by 2, which is 3,396 kilometers. There we go. Now, for the average temperature, we'll add minus 87 to minus 5. You'll get minus 92, and so half of that is minus 46. So that's not exactly the average temperature, but it's halfway between the maximum and the minimum. It'll do for our purposes. So the tricky bit is we then want a degree sign so let's search for HTML entity degree symbol. That should tell us what we want. Ah, there we go. Makes sense. And deg. That's another quick hint for you. If you get the Google search term accurate enough, then quite often you won't need to leave Google at all for your result, and you can just take it from the Google extract from that page. So let's put in and deg, and then a C. All right, let's take a look. Mars, 3,403 kilometers and minus 46 degrees C. Fabulous. I think we'll just add one more row to our table. I'll do that just by copying and pasting. So let's do the same for Venus. So we'll scroll down to get our facts. Got some Venus facts there. So the diameter is 12.104. So we want the radius, so we'll halve it. So 6,052. And then it's only giving us a single temperature there, so we'll take that as the average 462 degrees C. Oops, I've made a typo there. I'll just correct that. 462 degrees C. Fabulous, let's take a look. Brilliant. There we go. Then we want to integrate a form into our table. So let's have another HR horizontal rule to separate them out. And then we'll add in a very, very quick form, which in fact is only going to have a button in it. So we'll have want to know more question mark. And then a button, remember, is input with a type of submit. And we'll put that inside paragraph tags as well. OK. 
Okay, let's have a look. So that's great. Submit though doesn't really make sense. So let's change the wording using value equals and then click here. Let's have a look. Now this is all well and good, but if we actually click there, then nothing happens because the page just refreshes. So what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit of a reward for making it all the way to the end of this tutorial and I'll teach you one more thing, how to get your form to submit to a particular page. And you do that using the action attribute, just like that. And then inside action, you put the URL of the page that you want the form to submit to. So let's say we want to go back to the Earth page, Earth Facts. Then we just copy that, Control C or Command C, and Control V or Command V to paste it in there. And now, when we click on the button, it will submit the form. Not that there's any particularly useful information in the form, but it, it will submit it to that URL, which just has the effect of redirecting that to the SpaceFacts page. Brilliant. So almost there. We'll now need a video of the Earth. So I'm going to search on Google for Earth MP4 download. Here we go. A few results, but I'll use this one from pixabay.com. You're of course free to use a different video of the Earth if you wish. Let's take a look at the video. I like it. This video is free to download and use. Going to save it in the same folder as my main file. I'll save that and call it Earth. That'll get saved as earth.mp4. To put that on our web page, we'll use the video tag with a width and height. So let's try a width of 320 and a height of 240. Specifying controls. And we'll specify a source for the video. So src equals earth.mp4. Then we specify the video type, video slash mp4. Let's take a look. Hmm, let's change the width and height to 640 by 480. Brilliant, that looks better. So it's not the best looking web page ever, but it contains a lot of the HTML elements that we've seen, and hopefully it's at least a good step up of what you could have done at the beginning of this section. So once again, congratulations on getting this far. Please do show me your projects, and I look forward to helping you make your websites look a lot prettier using CSS in the next section. Just before we move on to CSS, I'd like to take a couple of videos to show you how to set up the web hosting that comes with the course. Now's a good time to do this because you've just completed your first ever web page and I'm sure you're itching to share it with the world. And the web hosting is the ideal way to do this. I'm assuming that you've followed these steps in the how to get the free stuff video and have an eco web hosting account. If you haven't, then jump back to that video and follow the instructions there. If you have, then go to ecowebhosting.co.uk slash cp slash home. I should also say that if you want to work with a different web host or you don't want web hosting at all, then feel free to miss out the next couple of videos. But if you're not sure, then stick with me because the web hosting adds a huge amount of power to what you can do with the course. So this is your customer area at ecowebhosting.co.uk slash cp slash home. Here you can create a hosting package, which is what we're going to do next. 
or you can register a domain name. You don't need to do that, but if you want to be able to use your own domain name, such as robpercival.co.uk, then you will need to purchase the domain name itself. You're very welcome to do that with another company as well. Feel free to compare prices and go with the cheapest one. We've got some other options down here, but for now, we're not going to investigate any of those. We're going to go straight to creating a hosting package. So a hosting package is a place to store everything to do with your website. You can upload files to it. You can create databases, as we'll see later on in the course, and you can even create email addresses and manage your email through the hosting package. So all you have to enter here is a domain name, and I'm going to put in Rob Percival's test hosting package.com. You can select the hosting package type that you need. I would go for the advanced unlimited because that offers you the most features. And bear in mind that you'll want to create a domain name that no one else has chosen before. So if you try and put google.com in there, it probably won't work because there'll already be a domain on our system called google.com. If you're really having problems finding a domain name that's not already taken, just put some numbers on the end like that. Okay, so then click create hosting package and in the background it will churn through everything that needs to be set up for that hosting package. And there we go. So that's all been set up. You'll receive an email with all the login details for the package, but the easiest way to log in is go down to manage your services and manage hosting packages. And then you should see your hosting package in this list. I've got a number of packages that I'm not using anymore, but there is my Rob Percival's test hosting package. And if you click on that hosting package, it will take you to the cPanel. But I will warn you, it takes up to an hour for hosting packages to be fully set up. So you might want to go away, have a cup of tea, and then come back when the time has passed. Done that? All right, then let's go. So I'm going to click on the hosting package, and that will redirect me to the cPanel. So at the top here, we've got all of our file options. We'll be looking at the file manager in a bit more detail in a moment. Then we've got our email options. So we can create mailboxes, access webmail, set up forwarding, and various other things to do with email. Note that they will only work if you have your own domain name. So you will need to purchase a domain name to use email. Then further down, we've got lots of options which we'll be using later on in the course. So various stats features, databases, and a lot more. I'm not going to go into all of them now, but feel free to pause the video and have a click around if you want to see what's available. So first off, I'm just going to quickly show you how to use File Manager to edit your files. So here are the files in your hosting package. So we're going to double click on public HTML, and this is where you'll put all your documents that form your website. And you can see that the home page is index.php. Now PHP is another programming language which we'll talk about later in the course. On the web hosting, you can name your pages either .php or .html, but on your computer, you'll need to use .html. So if we want to edit the home page, we just control or right click and click edit. And then we can go back over to our text editor I'm going to use Command A or Control A on Windows to select all of this text and then copy that and then use Command A to select all of this text and Command or Control V to paste it in. So this now is all of our code for our page that we created, but it's on index.html on our hosting. So let's save that. There we go. And then it's saved. And now we can go back to our cPanel. And if we want to see that page in action, then we can click temp web address here and click visit website. And there you go. So this is your website live on the web and you can share this link with anyone and they will be able to see your website. Notice how it appears under this web address. And if you don't purchase the domain name, then you'll need to use this to refer to your website when you're sharing it with people. So if you want to use your website as an actual portfolio site or a blog or something like that, you probably want to purchase the domain name, but that's completely up to you. 
So that's as far as we're going to go in this video, but there is one more thing I'd like to show you before we move on, and that is you'll notice that using the file manager is not particularly convenient. We don't want to have to be copying and pasting from our text editor every time we want to update our site. So there's a much better way to access your files, and that is through something called FTP. FTP is short for File Transfer Protocol, and is essentially an easy way of uploading and editing files on your website. You'll need to download a couple of bits of free software, and I'll lead you through how to do that in the next video. So in this video, we're going to see how to set up FTP to connect to our web hosting to transfer and update files. There are lots of different FTP programs, and they all work much the same way. And I'm going to show you a couple of different options, but the one I'd recommend is free and available for all platforms, and it's called FileZilla. So if you just go to your browser and Google for FileZilla, then you'll find the main website here. And FileZilla is just a program that you can install on your computer to allow you to connect to your web space via FTP. So we want the FileZilla client, so click on that one. If you're on Mac OS as I am, then download that one. If you're on Windows or Linux, then it will hopefully give you the appropriate client to download. If not, then click on the Windows or Linux icons down there. Okay. If you're on a Mac, you'll get an option to download on the App Store, but we don't need to do that. You can if you like, but I'm going to go for the straightforward download option. Okay. Then find the file that you've downloaded, double click on it, same process in Windows and Mac, and agree to the terms and conditions. And this will then begin the installation process. It's pretty quick. On a Mac, I just need to double click again on FileZilla there and open. Windows, you'll probably get presented with the installer straight away. Then we'll click continue. You probably don't want the Yahoo search offer there. So I'd recommend clicking skip unless you want that. And again, for Opera. And then it will run through the installation process. All done. So we click finish and FileZilla opens up for us. Click OK. And this is the FileZilla interface, which is very similar to other FTP programs. Not particularly user friendly, perhaps, but we'll get to grips with it. And in a couple of minutes, you'll wonder how you ever lived without it. So you'll see on the left-hand side, we have our folder structure on my computer here. So you need to find your files that you've been working with. Mine are on the desktop. And there we go. So there's our index.html file and earth.jpg. You don't need to worry about these extra files here. They're just default Mac OS files, which we're going to completely ignore. All right, so now comes the time to connect to our site via FTP. I'm going to use the button on the top left there and create a new site. So we need the settings for our website to connect to FTP, which we get over in the control panel. And they're down here on the right hand side. So first off, you'll notice here that FTP is currently locked. This is a security feature of Eco Web Hosting to prevent other people accessing your files. You can either unlock FTP by time or by a specific IP address if you know that your IP address doesn't change. So if you know you're on a fixed IP address, then click Unlock by IP. If you don't know that, then it's probably best to unlock by time and best to pick the shortest time possible so that your FTP is as secure as it can be. So I'm going to go for one hour and click Unlock FTP. Okay. Now it's time to enter the FTP details. So first off, we've got our FTP server, which is ftp.stackcp.com. So I'm going to select that, copy, and then head back over to FileZilla and put that in the host name there. Then back over to get the username, which is just the domain name. So Rob Percival's test hosting package. You're obviously putting in your own website details, not mine here. We change the login type to normal. And we paste that domain name into the user field. 
while I've got it in the clipboard, I'm going to add it here in the site name as well. So I'll paste that in. Lovely. So you can have a collection of different sites and you can quickly choose between them within your uh, FTP software. And then the password, you don't have to include that. You might want to type it in every time. If someone gets hold of your computer and they're able to log in and you leave the password here, then they will be able to access your files. That's okay, I think, while you're developing and just testing out an educational site. For a more seriously secure site, you probably want to enter the password each time. Okay, then we'll just click Connect. And as I say, I'm gonna use Save Passwords for now, but you've got a couple of options there. You might not want to save the password or you want to have a master password, which allows you to access all of the other passwords. I'll leave that up to you to choose. Make sure that you see stackcp.com in the certificate. And then I'd recommend always trusting that certificate from now on and then clicking OK. And if you've entered all the details correctly, you should see public HTML there and the logging in successful message at the top there. So congratulations, connected to your site via FTP. And the files, as we saw in the previous video, are all inside public HTML. So I've just double clicked on that. We can spread that out so we can see the full file name. So at the moment, we've only got the index.html file. That's why the image here is not displaying correctly. So let's, for a little bit of practice, upload our first file via FTP. It's very easy. We'll take our earth.jpg file, and then I'm gonna control click or right click on Windows and upload. And then you can see that has uploaded. The earth.jpg file is now on our server. And if I go back over and refresh this page, hurrah, the lovely earth image displays. So we're connected to FTP and we've uploaded a file. Let's just quickly see how we edit files using FTP. So I'm gonna take my index.html file, control click again and view slash edit. And this takes me to my editor. And you can see I've got the code of my Hello World page there. So just a very simple edit. Let's say I want to include other worlds in my announcement there. So we'll just change that twice. And then I'll use Command S to save, or Control S on Windows. Go back over to FileZilla. And you should see that the file has been changed. Do we want to upload this file back to the server? Yes, that will then upload our edited version of the file. And if I go back and refresh, you can see that edit has taken place. So it's as simple as that. I should offer a small word of warning. Editing in that way is very fast and simple, but if you have internet connectivity problems, you can on occasion get issues. If for example, it tries to upload the edited version of the file, but it can't, then occasionally you'll find that the, the file will be reduced to a file size of zero. That has happened to me before. So you do need to be sure that your internet connection is good if you're gonna be editing this way. To be absolutely sure that that's not gonna happen, you can download the file, edit it offline, then save it, and then upload it to just in the same way we did with the earth image. So up to you how you want to do that. But again, when you're learning, it's probably best to do things as simply as possible. So I'd recommend the editing directly method just to get moving as quickly as you can. All right, so that's how we set up FileZilla and use it to edit and upload our files. So I hope you're clear on how FTP works. And without further ado, head straight on to the end of chapter quiz for HTML. Good luck.